wasn't that fun. Anonymity. If you're supposed to be in something else, you probably should leave. Um, my name is Khan, and uh, I'll be talking about stealth data dispersion. Um, and I think after me will come uh, Len Sassman. Sassman, sorry. Tracing anonymous email. Okay. Okay. This. The whole concept here is that it started with the concept of what if you could have data that was mobile and could uh, uh, survive if nodes started getting removed from some sort of a network, uh, so it could move around the network and be uh, uh, survivable. Uh, but this is a part of that research which is still on ongoing, which has come up, which has some interesting uses for privacy-related issues. So. You can talk about what if you wanted to hide data securely uh, without having it on, on any local physical device. Uh, more importantly, uh, the data wasn't any one place at any given time, so it's moving. And uh, more importantly, what if you could use existing protocols to do it so that it doesn't seem like something strange is going on to IDSs or otherwise uh, uh, snooping folks. Um, I'm sure some of you are aware that you know sometimes you have a piece of data that is uh, possibly shouldn't be in your possession, or even if it is in your possession, you don't want anyone else to ever know that you had it. Uh, I'm sure you can come up with what that might be, such as keys, etc. Um, and the concept was: it is my understanding that most forensic ex experts, when they appear, or you know, some sort of legal action or what have you takes place, people usually walk in grab everything you own and take it to their local federal office or what have they. Uh, and how do you defeat that? Just had one of our uh, projectors go out, guys. DEF CON people. Anybody? Yeah, might be that plug thing that came on. <laughs> Sorry, I just put it back in. Uh, probably... Yeah, it's broken. Yeah, the wall jacks, bro. Can you switch it? Well, I mean, you might have to turn it on. <laughs> this is what happens when you're the first speaker. <laughs> Quality testing you. Yeah. <laughs> the new guys always get the first. All right, we'll let them work that out. Uh, sorry. We'll let them work that out. Um, so let's move on. So the goal was to reside small amounts of data. I think that's sort of crucial to understand. You can't have megs of data flying around. Uh, we want small amounts. Uh, and I'll get into that. It comes into when we start looking at the actual protocols. It has to do with uh, not, you know, your MTUs in your uh, um, protocols. Uh, such as Ethernet are usually around 1,472 bytes after the header. So that's about what each packet we're going to talk about. I'll explain it a little bit later, but small means small. It doesn't mean, you know, thousands of uh, megs or even one meg even. I'm sure you could do a meg, but we'll talk about it later. Okay, the simplest way to describe it is it's a drop safe. Like you go to 7-Eleven and they got a $20 bill, and what do these guys do? They don't want anybody to come in and rob them. So they have a safe there that they stick the $20 bill in, and it's a very, uh, you know, safe safe. And uh, only the guy who needs to come and get this $20 bill later, such as an armored car or what have you, can uh, retrieve that money. I think the main crux of this is an anti-forensic tactic. Uh, somebody had mentioned to me when I had submitted my abstract, isn't this just another covert channel? I mean, you could consider it an asynchronous covert channel. Uh, the goal is not to communicate. The goal is to hide data. So I, I leave it to you guys to figure out. Okay, what's the main benefit? The main benefit is that the data will disappear if the hosts the seeding hosts, and I'll get into that, are removed. So that can be useful in some cases. After looking at, uh, I mean, obviously we're going to use the internet to do some of this. Um, 
small amounts of data at this case is uh, less than 1,500 bytes, uh, which is based on a PPP MTU. Uh, my understanding is that the Ethernet is almost the same. Um, the actual, as I said, it's 1,472 uh, bytes that you can keep per packet. Uh, and, it, and it'll become obvious why. Uh, so the data will stay alive on the wire uh, versus a storage device as long as possible. Uh, data is never stored on a host. Um, concept, as I said again, is you don't want it anywhere. Anybody can reach it. And uh, data is retrieved or refreshed before it expires on the wire. If you look at the TCP IP uh, um, implementation, uh, the biggest issue is that you can't have data around longer than 255 hops. Because uh, the TTL, as soon as it gets to zero, uh, the packet gets dropped. Uh, so that's something you have to be aware of, but to be perfectly honest with you, after playing around, and I was trying to bounce data off Australia, Japan, Fiji, uh, you know, Mongolia even, I got in there doing trace routes. I was getting to most places in 30 hops or less, so I, I don't think you're going to have an issue of getting close to 255 hops on a single packet. Okay, so what are existing protocols we can talk about? Um, one of the more obvious ones uh, is Echo Service. You know, it's on Windows. Uh, if you load the internet server thing that they have, uh, it's available on TCP, it's available on UDB. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, and I'll talk about each one of these a little bit more. Uh, it's good enough to start off with, but it's not very good because port 7, Echo, you know, it's sort of obvious for anybody who's looking at your uh, traffic. Uh, you can use ICMP Echo requests. Those are far more interesting and far more useful, I think. Uh, the third I would have liked to have more data on, I don't yet, is multicasting or somehow tricking IGMP into working for you. Uh, multicasting is great because then you could send you know, one piece of data out and it, it goes out to, you know, I don't know, 100,000 hosts over the world. Uh, there's a lot of that data going around. I'm sure you know people are listening to real audio streams and all that business. It's all multicasted. So that's very useful. And um, these are the three main candidates I came up with. I'm, I tried looking for more. Uh, I really haven't found anything that will natively echo back data that you push out. Uh, the point is that I only want one host that I control, and I want to somehow use all the rest of the hosts on the Internet to comply with me in bouncing my data back. Uh, it, it's pretty easy to say, okay, well, I have 100 hosts dispersed over the planet, and we'll all talk to each other encrypted. Well, you know, there's not much to talk about there. Anybody can do that if you have that. Um, but we want to use native protocols to do the echoing. Okay, uh, let's talk about the INID echo service, uh, the pros and cons. Uh, it, it's implemented mostly on all Unix machines. Uh, the UDP implementation would be better uh, because we don't need a TCP handshake. Uh, only difference is most people who do follow, you know, somewhat some security or otherwise uh, uh, guidelines almost always turn these services off, so it's not usually active. Uh, also, it's rather obvious. Port 7, as I said before. My preferred candidate right now is the ICMP echo mechanism. Uh, the greatest thing about it is the ICMP uh, is required on all TCP IP stacks. Okay? Every printer needs it. They have to have it. Uh, I, I forgot to put in the RFCs that actually require it. It's part of, a, I think there are two RFCs that clearly define that you must have ICMP on all TCP IP stacks. You must also have it um, echo back pieces of data as required, and almost everybody's stack has it. I haven't found a stack that doesn't have it yet, so that's extremely useful. Uh, they are required to echo back the original data. I don't know how many folks actually play with you know, uh, ICMP more than doing a ping and uh, doing a trace route, but it, within the pings you can actually put your pieces of data and, and check it, make it bounce back, and it's it's actually quite useful if you're having problems, if data is getting dropped or down the stream or something, what you do is you can put a specific piece of data that you think is getting dropped, and that's why they have this mechanism, so you can send it down, you know, down your route and see where it might possibly not get forwarded properly or get cut off or fragmented or what have you. Uh, it's universally available, and there's a huge amount of ICMP traffic always present on the wire. 
so it could be very stealthy as long as you know somebody doesn't know exactly what you're doing. Uh, I might mention, you know, I mean, there's a lot of network management products out there that actually use ICMP echo requests to just check the status of a machine if it's up or not. I mean, you know, obviously that's not the best way to check it, but I, I remember a couple of versions back, Big Brother used to do it, and I mean, you name it, and everybody's using it. So you should be able to uh, 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 submerge your data within that traffic very easily. Okay. Um, what would be even nicer is if I could get the equivalent of that in a uh, multicast or an IGMP uh, based protocol. I tried researching it. I really didn't find anything. Somebody said, hey, well, why don't you uh, try sending a, a multicast message to the echo service? Well, that should work. Well, uh, it's not supposed to work because uh, um, those of you who are familiar with multicasting, you can't uh, regular TCP services are not supposed to be registered to receive multicast messages. Uh, so this is something worth looking into. I don't know the answer yet. Uh, that could be really cool if you could do it. Uh, this way, instead of having separate pieces of data being dropped to different hosts, uh, target hosts that echo them back, you could have one stream of data go out and get bounced off every real audio server or what a real audio client, that would be even cooler. There's a lot of people out there, you know, all the time listening to something or the other. Um, so I'm still working on it, needs a little bit more research. Okay, so which one is it? It's ICMP. Uh, again, it's available. More importantly than that, it is required and can be bounced. Um, the bouncing cases where you, I'll, I'll get into the details of that later, but that'll double your uh, uh, um, hops if you have more than one seeding host where you want to uh, uh, have some sort of uh, redundancy in the data that you keep on the wire. Okay, let's talk about more theory of operation, etc. There are two phases to it, a seeding phase and a bounce phase. Uh, you have a seeding host, uh, you start these two processes on it, and uh, here we'll show it a little bit better. Okay, so you've got this red piece of data that you want to hide and you're on your host. The seed injects data onto the network uh, and then quits. Data size has to be 1,472 bytes in this case with a 1,500 uh, uh, byte uh, MTU. So you put these two processes, seed and bounce, on there. Uh, seed grabs the data, uh, pushes out uh, ICMP echo request. It proceeds by removing itself and all associated data from your machine permanently. Now, obviously permanently doesn't mean you necessarily just, you know, do a RM on the file in Unix or Windows or whatever. You better make sure your data is gone, uh, zero out the uh, file, uh, you know, uh, storage. Uh, I leave that up to you how you're going to do it. That's really not something I'm going to get into. Uh, you know, there's a lot of products, etc. Just don't delink it and think your data is still there, obviously. For those of you I'm sure who have this kind of data know this. Okay, now the bounce phase begins. So again, seed's gone, data's gone. All you've got is a process left that's called bounce. Uh, so at this point, there is no data on your local machines of any sort. Bounce will provide and keep this data bouncing back and forth between this host and another host. Now, let's make sure we understand this. Bounce has to be written well. Um, you do not want a machine that's swapping a lot or otherwise. Um, with small amounts of traffic, we don't expect it to go to disk or swap to disk at any time. Obviously, it'll be in RAM. It is my understanding that with some cards and their drivers, it's even possible to have the ICMP uh, business take place right on the card, so it bounces right back. Um, but I'm sure there are other people who know better about this. Uh, I don't have the details yet. Uh, point is, please make sure your code is written well. You don't want it somehow ending up on your disk, even in a temporary file of some sort. It shouldn't. I mean, it's too small amount of the data in Linux or otherwise, but I don't know what, you know, what the hell Windows does. So, you know, it's anything is possible. <laughs> okay, so this guy keeps replying. Boom, it comes in, it calls out, but there's no data is no longer left on your... How do you um, get the data back out? 
uh, well, you harvest it. Uh, but you don't harvest, you don't have a process that does the harvesting and it sits there and it's quite obvious because if they do get it, then they have an idea something was going on. Uh, uh, it's strongly recommended that you sniff the data back out on the segment uh, while it's bouncing back and forth. Uh, you could have a harvest process, but that's a bad idea. Uh, that in itself, sitting on the machine, if the machine is in someone else's uh, power, uh, they'll be able to see it and figure out what that was. Um, what happens if your um, seeding host disappears? That is, somebody comes, grabs the machine, goes away. Well, the, uh, the response to the ICMP will come back and won't have anybody to uh, echo it back, so therefore the data will auto-destruct, therefore it will be no longer there. Um, this will make it a little bit more obvious now when I start looking. The happy faces are all targeted machines that you're going to find on the internet somewhere. Uh, try to find um, less than 255 hops, although I'd love to know if somebody can even find 200 hops. I haven't been able to. So as I said, you'll get 30 hops. Um, just to give you a very quick example, so you identify your hosts that you want to bounce off. So you know, get an ISP. Don't get you know Joe Schmo down the road with a cable modem or dial a PPP. All the PPP is useful because he slows down his response time. So if it's a very fast link, you're going to get very fast responses. Uh, you actually want to find people with slow links if you can. Uh, what that'll do is it'll keep the da data away from your machine for a long time. And that's what you want. A long time here means one second maximum. Usually, uh, I was bouncing off us. Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji, uh, and even uh, India, Pakistan, 0.5 seconds for a 15, one single uh, 1,500 uh, byte packet. So half a second is the best I was getting. Um, let's say in this case we have four hosts that we've targeted. So we'll have four ICMP. What we'll do is we'll seed it with and send it to four different hosts situated wherever you might. Uh, and they'll, they'll continue to echo it back and your bounce will grab this data and immediately echo it right back to these hosts. Uh, I want to mention something interesting. The CSS scramble.c, the first piece of code written to for the DCSS uh, code uh, compressed with zip is 2704 bytes, which is in this case two packets. So, because each packet has 1,472 data payload on it, so they, if, if that's just you know a simple example, uh, if you had that, you could actually keep it bouncing around with just two packets echoing back and forth between different machines. That's you know, I, I think what happens is at least I do over time, and uh, I hope somebody else does as well. You keep thinking you know you need a lot of packets to do a lot of stuff. Uh, you really don't. I mean, text files and such are really really small if you compress them well, so you don't need a lot of data to do this. Uh, this sort of shows you, you know, boom, you're echoing to one host, you request this, you request that guy, then they reply back to you, and ad infinitum, it keeps going on and on, the data stays on the wire. And now you can get a little bit more interesting. Um, in this case, let's say I have two machines of my own, and I want them to echo all the data back and forth without talking to each other. Uh, I can have them each have uh, uh, four hosts. This is for redundancy purposes. Let's say one machine goes, but the other doesn't go. Well, I could have both of these machines echoing this one piece of data back and forth, and if one fails and they're both on the local LAN, obviously the other can pick up the data and also continue making sure it exists on there. A more interesting scenario appears if you talk about uh, bounce mechanisms in the uh, TCP/IP protocol. Um, I shouldn't say bounce mechanisms, but an issue where you can screw around and make things bounce. Uh, this has been seen in many different things. Uh, no rocket science here. If you wanted to transfer data uh, from A to B, you could grab a host, V in this case, and send a spoofed packet from A with the data in it with the source saying that I am B really. And what that will do is, and the destination is of course the victim host, uh, the packet goes, hits the victim host, the victim host says, oh, who do I reply to? Oh, my dest destination should be B because that was a source. And therefore he turns around and bounces the data back to B. Uh, so, so you have indirectly actually transferred data from A to B. This is actually, <coughs> excuse me, 
Well, there's some covert channel related issues also on this stuff. It's quite useful to do something like this. Let's say you have uh, source filters of destination filters in the network you're in, and they say, well, you can't go to B. Well, you know, you can, as long as they don't che check that you're doing this, you can go to B as long as you find the victim host who implements the ICMP protocol, which would be any TCP IP machine. So that in itself is a very interesting uh, scenario, but uh, if you read COVID channel stuff, it's been discussed before and it's very useful. But we can put it to use here as well to make our data live longer and to provide more redundancy. Well, it looks like I'm going really fast here. Uh, but in any case, uh, the moon bounce multi-dispersal. In this case, we don't have hosts that are on the same LAN. Uh, imagine if you will, and if I can get my mouse here, if I'm bouncing between from A to this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, and I'm doing the same thing with B to these four guys, uh, you'll notice that the four victim hosts are shared between uh, uh, your uh, seeding hosts. I can get a to send a packet to the victim host and have it bounce back down to B and B to do the exactly the same thing and keep doing that. Now you can put, these are no longer on the same LAN, yet the data is now on two different networks uh, bouncing around between back and forth and either of those networks could pick it up when they needed to. This is actually also extremely useful if you're thinking in terms of IDS, etc. Uh, IDS is unless, you know, to make a filter to specifically look for this won't find it or wouldn't care most of the time. Uh, you know, somebody has to be looking at raw traffic to grab this stuff. More importantly, even if you're not allowed to go directly from A to B, you're now using the victim host not only to record your data for you, it's echoing down to some other, uh, you know, your friend's computer or what have you, where there's another bounce process running. Uh, and, I, I, you know, use your imagination a little bit, if you will, if you take five of these machines um, located over the internet, let's say one's in Australia, you know, I don't know, somewhere in Mongolia, USA, South America, you now have data that, that will remain alive between all five continents using this. And you could take out most of the sites and as long as one is left, this guy can recover, or at least two. They will recover the data. I mean, that's, that's a big interesting concept. I mean. I don't think I'm describing rocket science here, I mean, but the issue to understand is what we're really talking about. We're not really talking about, oh, wow, look, Khan did a really cool thing that everybody else has done a million times. I think the point to understand here is law enforcement can't go to five different continents simultaneously. Well, not yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that would be interesting to see if they can. Um, but since they cannot, and I'm not saying it's just a law enforcement issue. I mean, I understand France won't allow you to keep, you know, encrypted communications and all the rest, and I don't know the rest of the uh, government laws and uh, regarding privacy, et cetera, in other countries. And uh, either way, the, the point is that you will have, uh, try not to look at it so much as a technical well, advancement. It's not that big a technical big deal, but the concept is to start thinking, well, hey, I can get this data to be all over the world at any given point. I don't need a lot of machines to do it. I don't have to write some hardcore code to do it. Uh, let's say I encrypt some key, put it out there, which is sort of silly to encrypt a key, sorry, but let's say it's an image or something, I don't know. And you start bouncing it around. Well, you know what? If they get me and three of my friends, there's still two of my friends who could recover this in some somewhere else on the planet. And I think that's really what I'm trying to talk about here. So again, just giving you some very quick examples. I wish I, I'd gotten more. I uh, apologize, I didn't. Uh, I had the DCSS code, so I, I compressed it and checked it out. It was 2704 bytes. It would only require two ICMP echo request packets. I mean, that's, uh, that's minimal. Uh, uh, I don't know if those of you saw the actual uh, source code to the Apache worm.c, which is not a really good example, but still, I, I wanted to give a, an example. Uh, I'm sure if it would linked with binaries and all that, it would be a lot better, bigger, sorry. Uh, in this case, uh, the compressed text C file is 15446 bytes, which would require 10 point something packets, which is 11 ICMP packets to keep this code. Let's say I was developing this code, which I would never do. Uh, and uh, I strongly urge you all to stop. <laughs> but, uh, 
you know, maybe you don't want to keep it on your machine. Uh, I'm sure you know there are people here who can tell you better about that. Uh, well, 11 ICMP echo package is not a bad way to keep this code out there while you're editing and bring it on to Emacs every now and then. Possible uses. Well, you know, you can save keys if you have some key of some sort for encryption purposes or decryption purposes more, hopefully. Uh, you have some sort of source code or otherwise. Uh, emails, I don't know, you've, you've snagged somebody's email. Uh, it's got some sort of information that you can use later and you probably shouldn't have it. Well, emails are, uh, you know, notoriously small files most of the time. Uh, usually being text files, you can compress them. Images, that's another story. I think those would be pretty large. Um, and I guess you guys can tell me better than, you know, uh, what other things you could save. I think one interesting thing I wanted to mention was if theoretically we could reach the 255 hops limit, which again I'll mention for the 50th time, I haven't been able to do, using the bounce you could double it. You could have 510 hops. Uh, because you put it on a victim host, let's say theoretically 255 hops one way, 255 hops to the other machine. Theoretically you could get 510 hops, uh, which is useful because the longer you keep the packet on the wire before bouncing, the longer you don't have it and therefore it's autonomous somewhat. Um, you can have delayed packet releases over multiple routes. Uh, what I showed was a very simple way of bouncing between two machines, but imagine you're doing delayed releases over multiple routes. Uh, therefore, uh, you can work out some very simple protocol to make sure intermediary hosts are capable of detecting failure and responding accordingly. Well, we're already at conclusions, geez, that was fast. Uh, stealth data dispersal, uh, okay. So we can do it using current TCP IP protocol manipulation. It can be achieved very efficiently. I think that's sort of somewhat crucial. I just have to write one uh, a seeding host and have it. I don't need uh, a cooperating hosts to have this thing happen. It, it, it is very stealthy. Um, unless people are grabbing raw traffic. Uh, I don't think they're going to see it, or they shouldn't anyway. Uh, the uh, ICMP Moonbound has been rumored to be used as a covert channel by dark government agencies. Uh, that's what I read. Uh, I think it was Security Monday or something. Uh, one of the first time they discussed it. Uh, you know, I don't know what that means. Well, I put it there for those who do. Uh, I'll be looking at IGMP stuff in the future, and uh, here's the Earl and all that. And by the way, I just want to mention, I'll, I'll get you in one second, please. Uh, I, I substantially changed the uh, presentation from what it was on the CD-ROM, uh, or at least what they've put on the CD-ROM. So if you need the latest one, it's substantially different. That, uh, that one was talking about something more limiting, uh, but I was able to get something else done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. That's why I was talking about multiple seeding hosts. I don't think if you have something, anything really that critical, you should be putting it on just, you know, one machine and hoping it's the same old issue with if you have redundancy. I mean, if you have one hard drive and it fails, you better have a backup, right? So have more than one host doing it. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Well, they wouldn't have the other hosts. Uh, the, pro the processes, the minute you turn it off, Bounce's code is not sitting on your host. Right? You have a process running and you remove the executable. But if that is sent, right. 
What I'm saying is that it's only running in memory at the time. And once it's running in memory, no, I think he has a very valid point that he would have the destination of the host. Sure. Actually, he would be in the ICMP source packet that goes out, right? If you're using a bounce. Sure, that's right. No, I, uh, sorry. I'm trying to understand your question. Tell me what your exact concern is that there is that we know what the other host is, or well, if you don't know what the other host is, then why is it any less just storing the data on the other host? So you know, when when you're comparing this to what existing people do now, why why is this more secure? What they do right now is they're worried about their own data being stored on the host, right? Right. So if you know if you don't know what the other host is, Let's say you have two seeding hosts that are apart in two different networks, okay? And you go ahead and start bouncing the data on those hosts, and they are bouncing it off two totally separate sets of victims, okay? If I get rid of one host, the other one's still functioning and has nothing to do with this host unless they're cooperating. If you're cooperating, obviously, then you're opening up a can of worms, but that's up to you. But if I take this one out and I take it home, there's no way I know that there's a B machine out there doing the same thing. What's the connection between the two? How would there be a connection between the two? That's true, but more interestingly enough, uh, let's say they do get to the other machine also. Again, they won't find anything, right? I mean, these guys can get anywhere they want. Well, most of them don't use, usually watch the ICMP packets was the whole point, although after our little discussion here today, that's a different story, <laughs> right? I mean, they could even watch you, dude. I mean, I mean, you can keep taking this to the nth level. They could watch you type it in or get it in the first place. I mean, the point is to have a vault that you can put this data away and have some security. There is no such thing as 100% security. We can only get more and more secure, right? Right. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, when I'm forging the package, I was putting in a, an a ID in there, like you know, 666 or something, and that's a way for my bounds to be able to identify. I actually haven't done that exact test, but my guess is, I'm hoping, <laughs> I don't know how, how codes on all uh, ICMP stacks are written, but I think that's a good point. One would have to be careful, but I am already using a different ID on my uh, echo request packets. There's a, uh, I don't remember the exact, uh, um, where the ID field goes or whatever, but there is an ID field there and all the other packets, unless you're sending your own data in your case, uh, usually have that you know, from 66 uh, character onwards, sort of a string of characters. Uh, but I haven't done it simultaneously. That's a very good point. I don't know what it would do. Uh, I mean, I'm using uh, 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 Libnet to make the packets and PCAP to capture it. I don't know exactly what it'll do if there's it's coming in. I'm hoping that the session of some sort is held. I, I can't say for a fact. Uh, it seems like anyone who had access to monitor the traffic, uh, any machine can only monitor it for a few seconds. You get a copy of any data that needs to be sent. Yes, they would. Yeah, sure. Um, the gentleman here said all anybody would need to do is then uh, grab all your raw traffic and watch it and then grab the data. That is absolutely correct. For such a short amount of time, though, you only need 10 seconds of traffic. Well, the issue is which, ten, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the gentleman said, uh, well, you know, it won't even take but 10 seconds. You're completely right, but the point is, if you give them so much raw traffic, they can't capture it. Let's not think in terms of just one person they're trying to watch, okay? Usually, uh, you know, supposedly the NSA captures all raw traffic. I mean, Jesus Christ, raw traffic is going through the roof. 
And that's what you want. You want everything submerged in raw traffic and encrypted possibly in some way. So that at least if he's running a sniffer, he goes, oh, you know, that looks like something strange going on. I'm going to capture that whole stream in some way. Uh, there, there's no doubt that if you're looking for the specific thing, you will find it. The point is to submerge it in so much data that it becomes difficult. I mean, if I know what I'm looking for, I'm going to find it most of the time. There's no such thing as I can't put it in space, you know. Right. Again, a, a, a safe is not a 100% protected thing if I come in with, you know, all my equipment from the CIA or what have you. Uh, but it certainly makes it safer. And this is, if unknown to the people who are monitoring you, will submerge the traffic. That's just the whole concept. I mean, I'm not trying to say I've come up with some way the data disappears forever and only you can somehow bring it back. Right, uh, gentleman said just camouflage it. You know, some sort, uh, exactly, some sort of a coding scheme or encryption or what have you. Or make it look just like, I don't know, Windows or something. Uh, any other question? You got all the time you want. <laughs> Feel free to grill. <laughs>